let's get started, chat. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. Just a reminder that although I am a psychiatrist, hi, my name is Alok Kanoja. I'm a psychiatrist. But just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a medical concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. Stream is unfortunately not a substitute for medical advice. Hate to break it to y'all. Um, so next up, let's look at something real, real quick, real quick. Hold on. Let me find, where's, no, what? no. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's see, can I pop this chat out? Okay, pop out chat. Then I don't need you anymore. There we go. Okay, so now I've got chat open. Thank you so much. All right. Happy Monday, everybody. Today, we've got some fun stuff to talk about. We're going to be looking at ADHD and Doomer-related things. We're going to dive into a couple of scientific things, maybe a touch of spirituality here or there. I'm super excited about the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we have a couple of announcements before we kind of get into it, okay? So first announcement is it's hilarious. So uh, I love this community. And honestly, if y'all were to ask me, like, why do you love this community, Dr. K? I could say something like, oh, my God, I love it because it's full of positivity. And I love it because people are so good. Like, people are, oh, my God, they try so hard. Oh, my God, it's so great. If only that were true, chat. You must remember that despite all of my trappings, Despite my the cosmetics that I wear, despite the way that I attire myself, I am, at the end of the day, one of y'all. And what I love more about this community than anything else is the memes. So 10 years ago, stop eating junk food and go outside. F you, mom and dad. 10 years later, stop eating junk food and go outside. Everyone's like, oh my god, that's genius. Right? That's what we do here. We just repackage stuff that your parents told you to do. And because it's me saying it and I drop an F-bomb, y'all like it and you listen and that's the end of things. By the way, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but we're now in one of the top 2% of subreddits. We used to be like top 5% and we've grown. We're like doing pretty good, chat. Good job. Um, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. Second thing we're going to talk about is clickbait. So I made the mistake of making a video. And the video is entitled, Why You Shouldn't Resist Watching Porn. And people, understandably, um, the, the video, I guess, is doing pretty well because it was uploaded like, I don't know, like a week ago, and it's got 700,000 views. I don't quite understand what this comment means, by the way. So if y'all could explain this to me, that would be great. Um, therapist, when the credit card gets declined, I don't, I don't know why this has 19,000 upvotes. But everyone is, I, I, can somebody explain this to me? Like, what does this mean? Um, we're going to talk about clickbait in a second, but I, I don't know what that means. Literally, like I, I don't, I mean, I should know. Um, I, I, so, so this is once again, one of those things where it's like, even though I try to be one of y'all, um, it's really challenging to, oh, you take the service back. Okay. But what, what does that have to do with the video? I'm confused. Oh, implying your... Okay, I see. I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, thank you so much for explaining it, chat. All right, thank you. I would be lost without y'all. Y'all are great. Um, so let me just talk for a second about clickbait. So some people saw the title of this video and they were like, this video is super clickbait until you watch it. And, you know, the video is... I, I guess it's good, right? So I, I think that, like... I, I think when we make videos that are clickbait that are, like just clickbait right so it's clickbait like the idea is that like you think there's something of value in there when you open it up there's nothing of value that's what clickbait is it's a scam but in this video especially like i think the reason it's doing so well is because there's like a lot of good stuff in it and so it looks like a clickbait title and it kind of makes sense but like literally that's what the video is about there's this really fascinating principle of addiction that if you resist a craving so if you resist like a level five craving and then like your body goes up to a level eight craving, and then you fail at resisting that higher level of craving, 
what the body does over time is increases straight to eight. So it's like five doesn't get us what we need, so we're going to go straight to eight. This is, like, this is like a science thing, okay? It's like we know this. So the video talks about that. And literally, if we look at like, you know, I, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but sometimes what happens when you're addicted to something is that if you fight every single battle, like you're going to be cognitively exhausted and you're not going to win all of them. And losing a single one, strangely enough, like can, can create such big problems. It's a really weird concept. So here's kind of how we see it. The first is we're going to title things in a way that, that, that is geared to provide people with the information that we are trying to disseminate. Like we're going to title things to try to help people. That being said, we recognize that there is clickbait out there and that we are somewhat guilty of that. And so we take that very seriously. We appreciate y'all's feedback very seriously. I was super surprised. I mean, I, th I think it ma makes sense, but I really did not, when I was making this video, I was not thinking about clickbait. I was like, this is a really important principle that people need to understand. That is mindless resistance can sometimes lead to the wrong conclusion. And if y'all like remember growing up and your parents would just fight you every single time you wanted to play a video game or every single time you wanted to do this, they were just resisting, 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 resisting you, resisting you, resisting you. It doesn't end up in the right direction, which is a really weird thing, right? Because we think, oh, like you have to resist all the time. So like focal targeted resistance is what really leads to like good outcomes in my experience. So this was not attempting to be clickbait. This was like, this, and that's why I think the video does well is because like I, I sort of explain that and people like, oh, that's really interesting. And I think it helps people a lot, which is what we're here for. So we're going to continue titling things that way. At the same time, we recognize that our titles can be clickbait. And so we are working on mitigating that, right? So we're not going to make, I think, I hope, we're not going to make super clickbaity titles. And also we're going to start adding like a more detailed description, uh, either in a pinned comment or in the video description about what the video is actually about. So if y'all are concerned that like, because we, the problem is that we only have like six words or something like that, right? Like that's, we have to encapsulate the whole video in six words. So that, that's very hard to do. Like I'm fucking long winded chat. Like that's, you know, so, so, so we're going to try to fix that. So for those of y'all for whom the clickbait is bothersome, we apologize. And also you'll find a more detailed description of what the video is about that is more justifiably explained in a pinned comment or description. A couple of other things that we're working on are citations. So this is where it's kind of like complicated, but so when we make a video, there aren't particular citations for that video. Okay, so just to give you all an example, Hold on one second. So like the way that we do research here at HG is it's not like we set out to make a video and then we do research on that topic and then like the, all of those pieces of research are go into the video. What happens is we will thoroughly, thoroughly research and continue to research topics. So for example, like if y'all, let me just pull something up um, just to show y'all real quick. Hold on a second. We're going to get to ADHD Doomer real quick. Don't worry, chat. Okay, so if we look at this, for example. Um, so, like, the way that we do research at HG is we'll, like, we'll look at a lot of research, right? So this is, like, functional neuroanatomy of pleasure and happiness, nucleus accumbens, Modulation, reward, and aversion. Um, like Raji Yoga meditation induces gray matter volume changes in regions that process reward and happiness. The structural neural substrate of subjective happiness. Nucleus accumbens comprehensive review. Neurochemistry of the nucleus accumbens and its relevance to depression and antidepressant action in, in rodents. And then the nucleus accumbens and interface between cognition, emotion, and action. So the way that we do research at HG is it's not like we do research for a specific video. We will comprehensively look at a particular topic. And then what happens is like if I make a video on depression and I'll read, let's say, I've read, let's say, over the last year, probably a pretty accurate estimate, let's say 50, or, or let's use trauma. So 
over the last year and a half, I've read about 400 peer-reviewed articles on trauma. Now, anytime we make a video on trauma, like we don't necessarily have a bibliography for that video. So instead, what we're going to do is share with y'all the way that we actually do like our research. So we're developing a web page that has all of our citations based on a particular topic. And then what tends to happen is like if I read like 10 papers, right, what I'll do is like I'll use six of those papers in one video and then I'll use two of those same six plus these additional four plus two video two uh, things about some other topic. And like that'll be it for the next one. So we like read a lot of stuff. And I think the citations in every video is not really working out well for us, like because that's not practically how we do it. So we recognize that people like citations and they want further reading. So we're developing a resource for that. It'll probably start out like a web page that gets continuously updated. And part of the other reason that we want to do that is we're do building this as a resource. So like, why do people like citations? I mean, I, I don't know why y'all like citations, but generally speaking, I think of citations as, hey, I want to learn more about this topic. So what is the most useful thing for us to do uh, uh, for y'all as a community? It's like, if you're like, hey, I want to understand... ADHD and obesity. We're like, okay, cool. Here's a bunch of papers about that topic that y'all can take a look at on your own. So we're, we're working on that stuff. A couple of points. One is just that we, we take this feedback very seriously. So when y'all post stuff like this, like, you know, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Um, and thank y'all very much for the feedback, right? So for the clickbait titles, like, I, I get that there's some con concerns about it. We're continuously trying to find the balance between making a title that gets people interested in the information that we're offering and making a title that is accurate to the content of the video. I happen to think that this porn addiction one is actually like pretty accurate. Like that's what the video is like literally about the downside to resisting cravings and a mechanism that many people don't understand, which is I think part of the reason why people struggle with addiction so much. We don't know how it really affects our brain. So that's, by the way, what we're going to be talking about today, but not addiction. So we're going to be talking about um, uh, like ADHD doomer related stuff. OK, so got a, a lot of cool posts to talk about. Um, one other thing, speaking of trauma. So we, you know, we our trauma guide is like available for pre-order now, finally. So I started working on this thing like two and a half years, two years ago, let's say. I think our last ga guide came out maybe in 2022. So we've been working on this for about two years. Um, and that's how long it takes to build one. Like it's not it's not like a quick one and done kind of thing. So it's available for pre-order. Y'all can use the command exclamation point trauma to check it out. Um, it's it, I mean, I say this for every guide that I write, but it's the one that I'm the most proud of in this moment. Like so, you know, that's what that's what gets me excited about things and, and stuff like that. Um, I think it's really great. I think it's a guide really about so what I got super excited about about the trauma guide is that we don't know we don't know how we get shaped. Right? So like here's you and you exist in this present moment with all of your difficulties, all of your challenges, all of your advantages, all of your passions, all of your perceptions with how you perceive the world. So like you are crafted based on your circumstances. And what I love about the science of trauma, I'm not saying trauma is a good thing, but if you look at the science of trauma, the science of trauma is the best example of how a human being gets formed. Because you have this event, and then we investigate what is the impact of this event on this person's sense of identity, on their thoughts, on their behaviors, on their physiology, on their nervous system, their brain. Like, how do events shape people? And so what we've tried to do in the trauma guide is we use the lens of trauma, but we can deduce principles of how people get formed into the version that they are. What is the process through making this person? And our, um, our hope is that in understanding these processes, you can craft yourself into the kind of person that you want to or uncraft yourself away from the person that you are. And so we, we did a, a ton of research. I've done a ton of work on trauma. It's been one of the most fascinating. Like, I love it from a clinical perspective. 
it's kind of weird. Like I, I love a lot of the things that many of my colleagues run away from, which is like personality disorders, addictions, and trauma. Those are like three of my favorite clinical things to kind of focus on. Um, and so then they're all tied together. ADHD is up there too. So if y'all want to check it out, please check it out. It's made with a lot of effort, a lot of love. It's taken us two years and, and it's not just me that's been working on it. Like there's a whole, um, you know, we have like a whole creative process with a production company and they were really, really helpful and they're super awesome. Um, and, and then we've also got like, you know, people who are like our, our, our dev, the people on our dev team are like designing this stuff from the ground up. And like, there's a lot of effort and love that goes into it. And it's made for y'all. So it's not, once again, it's not a substitute for clinical treatment, but that's not what it's designed to be, right? This is about helping y'all understand the principles through which a human being is shaped. And if you understand, it's kind of like PC Master Race for humans, right? So like if you look at PC Master Race and building your, your own computer, if you want to create a certain PC, you need to know like how all the parts fit together. The problem is no one teaches us that. And interestingly enough, it's not like child development and things like that that I find the most fascinating about how a human being is developed. It's actually trauma because those are the individual events that shape us, right? So th this is like, it's kind of like how the source code of who you are is laid down through experience and how to undo some of that stuff, which is just super fascinating research. I mean, it's like mind blowing the clinical implications of like some of these papers and stuff like that. Anyway, so definitely check it out. <laughs> but enough of that. Um, and, and the reason that I like it is because I think that's actually what our community needs, right? So everyone, if you look at like even the posts that we, we, we're going to look at today, everyone's like, how do I fix this problem? And the answer, one version of the answer is almost always understand how you got into this problem in the first place. How did you wire in this way? Right? Because everyone, and then like once you understand the fundamentals of wiring, then you can like wire into whatever you want. So th that's what we're really optimistic about. We want to give you all some tools for that. I'm not suggesting that you can watch the guide and transform yourself into anything that you want to. Um, but, you know, I think it's like it's certainly a big step in the right direction. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's also like since, you know, PC Master Race over here. I was almost thinking about it like assembling a PC, which is something that I stopped doing a couple years ago. Sag. But, you know, I just couldn't keep up. And instead, I decided to, for the uh, sometime around 2010, I decided to start fo focusing on, instead of building PCs, building people and how that works. And that was a lot of fun. It's been great. It's been great. Okay. Um, all right. So we've got a couple things to talk about today. Okay, so we're going to give you all a choice, all right? I give you choice. I give choice, chat. We're going to talk about a couple things today. Oh, that doesn't... I don't like it when this happens where I'm zooming out and the picture is getting larger. What? It's so weird. What, what shenanigans is this? Okay, the night before a day off is more satisfying than the actual day off. We're going to talk about that. Um... Why does this always happen after a good head clearing walk? Five hours into the walk, my potential knows no bounds. I will accomplish greater feats than any man before me. I will un or woman. I will uncover every last secret of the universe. I will experience every possible emotion and never die. I will turn my life around the moment I get home. And then 10 minutes after getting home, damn. And the eternal ADHD doomer. Involuntary switches between an involuntarily switches between being an unstoppable force and an immovable object writes reminders to himself and doesn't read them wonders whether he's the r word lazy or both gets uh, got nothing done all day still feels overwhelmed and exhausted can't trust his own judgment etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're going to talk about all three of these this last one we'll get to if we have time but i want to ask y'all what do y'all want to do first Okay, it looks like a lot of people want five-hour walk. Great. Okay. So, five. Okay, we'll get to all three of them. All right. Yeah, so it's the 
title uh, go over topics again. Okay, so here are our choices. I'm going to try to make this poll. Dr. K attempts poll. You're live. I'm aware. I'm aware that I'm live. I figured that out. But thanks for letting me know. Okay, let's do poll. Oh, great. Okay, so ADHD Doomer is winning. Thank you so much, mods, for being there for me when I wasn't there for myself. <laughs> Y'all are the... Okay, great. And then let's see. Um, how do I see? Okay. Poll is up. Yeah, I see that. How do I see the... I, I'm seeing number two. So it looks like ADHD. Okay, so it sounds like people, no surprise, people want the topic of, okay, how do I close this poll? 1,000 votes. I'm going to close the poll. Okay, poll ended. All right, so, okay. So let's start with ADHD. Great, let's do it, chat. We're going to get to all three of them, don't worry. We've got time. All right? Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the eternal ADHD doomer, okay? So what we're going to actually do today is go over each of these features, understand why they happen, what the neuroscience vulnerabilities are, what goes on in ADHD that predisposes us to this. And the real challenge that we're going to discover is that one of the biggest problems with ADHD is not the symptoms themselves. One of the biggest problems with ADHD is our adaptations to the systems. So, uh, sorry, the, the symptoms. So the, the, one of the biggest problems that I see in ADHD is that you're living a life with ADHD. And the world is designed for neurotypical kids. They're not designed for you. And what this means is that you have to develop compensatory strategies in order to succeed, like chugging a gallon of caffeine before you get anything done. The problem is that the compensatory strategies that you develop actually cause problems later in life. So really good example of this is if y'all play games at low rank, what you will discover is that people at low rank do stupid things. And then you ask someone at low rank, why do you do this stupid thing? Like the, the classic thing that I tend to see a lot in the multiplayer games I play is playing a support role, like playing a support character in a non-support role. So you're like, because it, it, in my rank, like you can't play real support because everyone sucks. So you need to have like a good player to team up with in order to play this thing the way it's supposed to be played. And instead, what I'm going to do is play in some way that only works at my low rank MMR. And then what tends to happen in this situation as you play this weird strategy that kind of sometimes works in your time because you try doing it the regular way and that doesn't appeal, appear to work, right? That's just like ADHD and neurotypical. I tried to do it the neurotypical way, the way that everyone is, says that you're supposed to. It doesn't work for me, so I have to come up with my own adaptation. But then what ends up happening is that you are training yourself in habits that as you climb ranks, as you improve in life, start to create more problems, and so a lot of what I see in ADHD is a lot of unlearning that has to be done. And the biggest challenge here, especially when we look at a lot of these adaptations, is that sometimes we'll do things to win a particular game, but it forms the wrong habits in the long term. And if you stop and think for a second about, see, anytime you develop a good habit, the development of the good habit is not an advantage. At the very beginning, the development of a good habit comes at a cost with very little reward. Does that make sense? So like if I start exercising regularly, the first three months are going to suck. There's no, there's no reward. It's just torture for the first three months. The reward happens later. And this fundamental principle of habit building that it comes at a cost at the beginning. So another good example is using a calendar. So if I start using a calendar at the very beginning, I'm remembering everything in my head and using a calendar doesn't actually benefit me. Using a calendar benefits me once I get into the habit of it. So in training, good habits comes at a very high cost at the beginning and brains with ADHD are particularly vulnerable to that. So let's take a quick look at why this happens. 
Okay, I'm going to mute myself. So I think this is Russell Barkley. Now explains to these parents, this child can play video games for hours and cannot do homework for more than a few minutes. Because the video game provides external, continuous, 100% consequences for interacting with it, and the homework does nothing. When a problem is solved on a sheet of paper, nothing happens. The consequences are delayed, and therein lies the trouble. So the corollary of this is if you want to see an ADHD person fail, put him in any environment where there are no consequences, and I guarantee you failure. It will not get done. I guess the person cannot self-motivate. And this is not a choice, and this is not willful, and this is not a child who just would, if they wished, wake up tomorrow and smell the coffee and get busy and do the work. They cannot. This is an internal neurogenetic executive failure. You can't self-motivate like other people. So it doesn't matter what your goals are, you won't get there because self-motivation is required. The fourth executive all right, so let's take a look at this, okay? So I think this is a great take on ADHD. Um, and I think this principle leans into a lot of these problems. So what we're actually going to start with is just re like reading each of these out, okay? So involuntarily switching between unstoppable force and immovable object. Okay, so we're going to explain, we're going to get into each of these in detail, okay? Abandons anything. Uh, that they're not immediately successful. Right, and so thankfully Dr. Barkley has already explained this to us, so we'll, we'll see these. Tired of people telling him to just try harder, even though he knows they're right. Try harder, noob. Okay. Writes reminders to himself. But doesn't read them. So we're going to break each of these apart, okay? Um, sp spends weeks... Preparing for a task. Preparing for small tasks. Chugs gallon of caffeine. Okay. Can't regulate emotions. Um, wonders whether question lazy, question stupid, right? Uh, watches a video on mute while listening to it another, all the while distracted by thoughts. So let's say sensory overstimulation. Okay. Um, doesn't do anything. No tasks finished but still tired, exhausted, and then can't trust his own judgment. Okay, so let's take a look at these and understand each of them in turn, okay? So we're going to the top. So let's start with this very simple one of involuntarily switching between an unstoppable force and an immovable object. So a lot of people think that ADHD is about distraction, that I cannot focus my mind. But if we really look at it, what ADHD is, is, is a disorder of attention. Okay, now this is important to understand. So when we say this is a disorder of attention, and we cover this a lot in the guide to ADHD, it's a central feature. So disordered attention means that I'm not in control of my attention. And if we look at the way that we need to control our attention, we need two fundamental capabilities to control our attention. One is to shift our attention away from something when we need to. And the second is to shift our attention towards something when we need to. So this is, and it's a disorder in both directions. 
And this is actually what leads to so much underdiagnosis of ADHD. So a lot of parents that I work with will say, okay, my kid doesn't have ADHD. He can sit there and play Legos for five hours without being disturbed. He is capable or she is capable of focusing for long periods of time. Therefore, they do not have ADHD. Absolutely consistent with ADHD. So people with ADHD struggle with hyperfocus, which means they're still not in control of their attention. If they tell their attention, hey, it's time to focus on something else, they're not able to do that. What people are very familiar with is the inability to focus on what you want to. So their mind is distracted in a thousand different places. I can't get it to focus on one thing. And the opposite is true, where once I focus on this thing, I cannot get it to deviate my attention elsewhere. This is also why kids with ADHD get yelled at more, and this will come later as well. So what parents will oftentimes learn is that I require a larger stimulus to break through their hyperfocus. So you have to yell at your children to literally get their attention. So this is important to understand. So our brain has this part, uh, we have this part of our brain called the thalamus. And the thalamus integrates all kinds of sensory information. And it tells us, it brings certain sensory information to our attention. So if I'm like walking down the street and there is a snake in the path, something, even though I'm seeing blades of grass and birds and leaves and sunlight and cars and whatever, I'm, my brain is receiving all of the sensory stimulus, but I'm not aware of it. The thalamus comes in because it's integrating all that information, processing all that information, and then it serves something up to you. And it says, hey, stop doing what you're doing because there's a snake here. And then we notice there's a snake and we jump. So this is the healthy way that our brain should work, where there is a normal balance of being able to break our attention on one thing and be able to shift it to something else. This is why people with ADHD feel like they are alternating Right, And you don't get to control it, by the way, between an unstoppable force and an immovable object. So you're able to hyper-focus on things, and there are other times where it's impossible to get started. And that is because we are not in control of our, motive, uh, our attention. Our attention is way too dysregulated. It can hyper-focus in some places and uh, make it impossible to focus in others. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing. All right, so abandons anything immediate uh, unless it's immediately successful. Unless. Okay, so let's take a look at why this is. Abandons anything he isn't immediately good at. Why is this? So Dr. Barkley does a great job of explaining this, so let's understand this. We have this other part of our brain called the nucleus accumbens. And if you look at people with ADHD, this is where our dopamine reward circuitry is. And so what happens in the brain of someone with ADHD is that they are vulnerable to the nucleus accumbens. So this is important to understand. So here's our nucleus accumbens. Here are our frontal lobes. And generally speaking, there is a tug of war between these two things. So our frontal lobes are the part of our brain that will tell us... Oh, oh shit, you guys can't see this. Whoops. I guess it doesn't... Whoops, sorry. Oh, crap. Do I need to redo this? Hmm. Hold on, chat. Um, let me look at this. Okay, so let's. I'll, I'll just do this again so that y'all can see, okay? So let's go through each of these features. Involuntary switches between an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Abandons anything he isn't immediately good at. Tired of people telling him to just try harder even though he knows they're right. Writes reminders to himself and doesn't read them spends weeks mentally preparing for a task that takes 15 minutes to complete, chugs caffeine by the gallon, cannot regulate his emotions, ruled by fear and feelings of inadequacy, wonders whether he's retarded, lazy, or both, watches a video on mute while listening to another, all while distracted by his own thoughts, and got nothing done all day, still feels overwhelmed and exhausted and can't trust his own judgment. So you know what's really funny about this? There's a decent chance I'm on the ADHD spectrum in some way. And this is like the perfect example of my attention being so focused on something that my thalamus is not telling me, hey, you haven't switched your overlay. P 
people can't see what you're talking about. They have no fucking clue. You're in your own world, just running full speed speed ahead. I become an unstoppable force, and y'all are not able to break into my thalamus and alert me to the fact that you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Right? This is classic ADHD, and we see it right here. Hilarious. I couldn't have planned this better. Okay? So, let's kind of go back to this. All right? So, this is a disorder of attention. Now, let's go back to abandons anything unless it's immediately successful. So, we have our nucleus accumbens, which is over here. This is our dopamine reward circuitry. And then we have our frontal lobes. So when these two things interact with each other, there's a tension. So the frontal lobes are responsible for something called executive function. Okay. Hold on a second. I can move this around a little bit. Okay. Oh, looks like we lost the X. There we go. Okay. So executive function is the ability to plan and execute tasks which usually involves delayed gratification. Whereas the nucleus accumbens is responsible for immediate gratification. So it's like, let's say I'm having a sandwich and someone asks me, or like I'm having a burger and someone asks me, do you want fries and, and a drink with that? And so my frontal lobes are like, those are unhealthy for me. I should not have those things. And my nucleus accumbens is like, hell yeah, let's go. So what we tend to find is that there is a development of these two parts of our brain. The nucleus accumbens develops very, very rapidly. It's very, very potent in kids. The frontal lobes develop more slowly. So they develop until somewhere between the age of 25 and 35. <clears throat> some literature will say that the nuclear, I mean, the executive uh, function kind of maps, uh, maxes out around 25. That hasn't been my clinical experience. So there are studies about this that are a little bit dated, but I think we actually mature well into our 30s. <clears throat> so game's not over for y'all. If you're like 27 and your frontal lobes are scuffed, it's still okay. We'll be okay. Don't worry about it. So what happens in ADHD is that the balance between these two things is... It's imbalanced. Our nucleus accumbens is, relatively speaking, stronger than our frontal lobes. And this is what Dr. Barkley is talking about. So, like, we need some kind of immediate gratification in order to reinforce the behavior. And we really struggle with delayed gratification. Now, when Dr. Barkley says that this task is impossible, that's where I disagree a little bit. So I think effort is really important to understand, and we'll get to that in a second. We're going to talk about try hard or noob, but this is not hopeless. So just to give you all a couple of different examples, okay? So I think it's it's fair to say that at default, this task is very difficult for people with ADHD, but we know there are a couple of good points. One is that we know that psychotherapy for ADHD is just as effective as medication. We can see vast improvements in clinical symptoms through the implementation of psychotherapy. And psychotherapy for ADHD is a ba basically like brain training. It's like training your brain to adapt to your circumstances in a healthy way that allows you to achieve what you want to achieve without too high of a cost, right? So this training is really slow. So the reason that we don't do it automatically is because we sort of figure out adaptations. And this is the real challenge with ADHD is the only adaptations that we're capable of making are the ones that give us immediate reward. So I want you all to think about that for a second, right? This is what's really crippling about ADHD for people in life is that you can't make an adaptation that doesn't work right away, which is exactly how we get to things like gallons of chugs of ca caffeine by the gallon, because any kind of habit that will lead to success over time is not something that your brain sees the reward from. So this is really important to understand, okay? So when we when we do an action, when we anytime we take an action, at some point the action is rewarded. Okay? So I'll give you all just a let's draw this out and understand this. This is the real challenge with ADHD. So let's say I take an action at time point T zero. 
and then there is a lag, and at time, let's say, T1, which is, let's say, five minutes, or T2, which is 50 minutes, or T3, which is five days. So if we look at something like exercising, what we find is that the action takes place over here, but the reward may be over here. And so our nucleus accumbens looks at the consequences of our actions, and then if the reward is over here, it will go back and reinforce this action. The problem with ADHD is that these two things are not available to us. Because of the way that our nucleus accumbens works, unless it gives us an instant benefit, we cannot reinforce that behavior. So I was working, a, a video game company asked for my help. And they said, Dr. K, can you help us make a more positive community? And I said, sure. And so then I asked them, how do y'all address toxicity? And they say that, okay, we have this reporting system. And the reporting system happens, and then someone files a report, and then it goes through this process, and then we take action on the report. I said, what's the amount of time between the action and the, uh, the, the, the mistake or the thing that the, the toxic behavior that the player makes and the consequence from that behavior What's the time lag in that space? And they're like somewhere between two weeks and two months. And I was like, this is never going to work. So I want you all to think about this for a second. Let's say I play a video game today. I queue up for a game and I'm a toxic shitter. And then sometime randomly, like 52 days later, I log into my account. One day ban. Ban, bitch. What do you think my reaction is going to be? Do you think I'm going to learn from my mistakes? What do you think is going to happen to my toxicity? You think I'm going to be better? I'm going to be like, oh my God, I made this mistake. Oh, poor my teammates. Oh my God, my widow teammates. I hurt their feelings. Oh no, I hurt their feelings. I need to be a better person. I'd be a nicer person. Yeah, I'd be better. I'd be nicer. I no longer be toxic. No, no. No, it doesn't work like that. Imagine if you're potty training your dog and your dog pisses the bed. And you come back 48 days later and you're like, bad dog. The dog is like, what? What? This is the problem with ADHD. We need immediate consequences. This is why people with ADHD, the, and the reason we need immediate consequences is because of the, brain, the way the brain is wired. So we are so sensitive to this dopamine circuitry and dopamine doesn't get delayed reward. It's not like when you have an epic game and you win, you're like, oh my God, the team is winning. We're going to lose. And then you make some last minute comeback and you win. It's not like you, like you wake up 28 days later and you're just like, wow, that game was so much fun. Oh my God, rush of dopamine randomly 28 days later. It's not how it works. There's a time binding, there's a temporal binding between the action being taken and the reward being given. And people with ADHD are more sensitive to that temporal binding, which means that they need immediate rewards, which in turn means that they are not capable of implementing long-term plans that will benefit their lives without help because every single step requires a dopaminergic reward. That's why it's impossible for them to do homework. That's why it's impossible for them to study because all they see is the effort and they do not see a reward. Okay? So, let me think. Do I want to include anything else? Does this make sense? So I'm going to just talk about habit formation again. So this is why people with ADHD, so the re real challenge, this is what's so frustrating about ADHD. The one part of the brain, not the one, but one of the parts of the brain that is actually unaffected by ADHD is habit circuitry. So people with ADHD are generally speaking capable of forming habits. So this is a completely different part of the brain. It's the endocannabinoid system. This is how we form habits. The problem is that even though that circuitry is intact, the way in which we form habits involves the nucleus accumbens. Does that kind of make sense? I don't know if you all understand the difference between the two. So once it, a habit is laid down, the habit is just as accessible to someone who has ADHD. But the laying down of the habit is almost impossible. 
because in order for the habit to be laid down, we need an immediate reward. So what do we end up seeing? This is why people with ADHD get stuck in video games and other forms of addictive substances, because their capability of forming a habit, their ability to pour concrete, is their concrete solidifies just as well as a neurotypical person's. The problem is the way in which they can pour concrete is dictated by their dopaminergic system. So the only time I will pour concrete is if I get an immediate reward. So their habit capability is normal, but the habits that they are capable of forming are very restricted to dopaminergic reinforcement, which is why they get so addicted to video games. Because as you play a video game day after day after day after day after day, you're pouring concrete, pouring concrete, pouring concrete, but you only get to pour concrete in this one place. All of the other attempts to pour concrete to make walkways, driveways, freeways, that doesn't work. The only thing we can do is fill up our toilet and fill up our sink with concrete. And this is what happens with people with ADHD. They get addicted to games very easily. There's vulnerability to the nucleus accumbens and dopamine. That is absolutely there, but it's so much more complicated than that. This is what's beautiful about the science of ADHD. We, learn, we know so much more, okay? So it's you can form habits, but... Which habits you are formed are controlled by the dopaminergic reward. So if you get an immediate reward, then that will become habitual for you very easily. Okay? So, let's move on. Next. So this is why we ab abandon anything that you're not immediately good at, because there's no immediate dopaminergic reward, which means that we cannot engage in the behavior again. Tired of people telling him to just try harder, even though he knows they're right. So this is a huge problem, okay? We've talked about this quite a bit. We made a whole video about ADHD and depression, which y'all should definitely check out. This is a huge part of Dr. K's guide to ADHD as well. So there's this idea in ADHD that more effort will yield better returns. And so what oftentimes happens in ADHD is we see a misdiagnosis because people notice, oh, this person is capable of focusing. This person is intelligent. And if they are intelligent and capable and the behavior doesn't happen, what's missing? Lazy. There's a lack of effort. So you need to put forth more effort. This is incorrect. Effort doesn't work if you do not have the tools necessary. This is like telling someone who's missing a leg, if you try harder, you should be able to walk. Right? The difference between someone who's missing a leg and someone who has ADHD is the missing leg is visible to everybody else. But the ADHD deficit is in your brain. It's not visible to anyone. In fact, they see particular things that make you think that you're neurotypical, like IQ. They recognize that you're not stupid. But you don't have the tools necessary for the effort to suffuse. Right? So if we think about effort, effort is energy. It's like electricity. But electricity requires a circuit board to go through to manifest something. So what happens is everyone is looking at your house and they're saying there's no lights on inside. You need more electricity. But you have plenty of electricity, there's no light bulb. So you can have all the electricity in the world, but if there is nothing for the electricity to flow through, you will not get the result. So this is the problem in ADHD. It's not a lack of effort. Then what happens is everyone doesn't see this, right? They don't understand that you don't have light bulbs. So they say you need to jack up the electricity, jack up the electricity, jack up the electricity. And so then you end up doing that. But you can jack up the electricity as much as you want to, but if there's no light bulb, there's going to be no light. And this is where we get to a lot of these other manifestations. Okay? Gets nothing done all day, still feels overwhelmed and exhausted. Wonders whether he's retarded, lazy, or both. These are all parts of the same thing. So then what happens is when we recognize I'm putting in a lot of effort and you feel exhausted, imagine for a second what the conclusion is. So if I'm pumping in effort, right? And this is an, another great example right here. Spends weeks mentally preparing a t for a task that takes 15 minutes to complete. So when I look at other humans who are capable of finishing a 15-minute task in 15 minutes, and it takes me weeks and tons of effort, and everyone is telling me to put in lots of effort, just think about this equation for a second. 
what is the only logical conclusion? Is that I'm messed up in some way. I'm cursed. I'm defective, right? Because I'm putting in so much effort. I'm so exhausted at the end of the day. It's so easy for everybody else. And it makes sense, right? Because if you're putting in all this effort and you're not able to do things and it's so hard for you to do ordinary stuff, then the only conclusion is you're just as smart as they are. So you must be lazy. You must be dumb in some way. You must be busted in some way. This is the conclusion that people have. And if you look at studies of comorbid populations from ADHD and depression, people who are diagnosed with depression have a 3% chance to develop ADHD later in life. But if you are diagnosed with ADHD, you have a 70% chance of developing depression later in life. Why? It's because of this. It's because you look at the world, you assume that you're neurotypical, you put in lots of effort, you try as hard as you can, and you are unable to gain the result. And so the only possibility, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, right? So like, if I look at, here's me, or let's say here's a normal person, here's a neurotypical person. They put in 10 units of effort and they get 10 units of reward. But if you have ADHD, you put in 10 units of effort and you get one unit of reward. So what's the only way that you can, oh, hold on. Okay, so you, if you're neurotypical, 10 units of effort gets 10 units of reward. And if you have ADHD, 10 units of effort gets one unit of reward. What's the only way to make this equation work? You need a minus nine over here of some kind. Doesn't matter. I don't know if I'm lazy. I don't know if I'm pathetic. It's some kind of negative quality, right? It's the only way to make it work. And this is their observation. Their brain, their ability to calculate is completely intact. Right? So they, they understand this. People with ADHD get this. And this is what ends up leading to things like self-esteem problems. Because what other explanation is there? Because people with, it's, it's really sad. Kids with ADHD have a very good intuitive sense of their IQ. The, pe the adults around them have a very good intuitive sense of their IQ. We're very good as human beings of being able to tell, like, who is in the bottom quartile of IQ who is in the top quartile of IQ, and, like, who's in the middle. Like, we're not great at detecting, like, let's say 130 versus 140 or 140 versus 150 or 70 versus 80 or things like that, but we can tell if you're above 100, like, significantly above 100, around 100, or below 100. And the real tragedy of people with ADHD is that they know that they're, like, just as smart as the kids around them, which means that there must be something else wrong because the effort that they put in does not yield a normal amount of reward. Okay, so this principle, then what we conclude is that people should just try harder, right? It's a lack of effort. And then something even more damning happens is that if it's a lack of effort and it doesn't work, then you conclude that you are lazy. So then you make this conclusion that you are lazy. This becomes a truth for you. This becomes part of who you are. This becomes a part of your identity. And then the moment that this becomes a part of your identity, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one of the really interesting things, so I was working with, um, this was back when I was in residency. So I was working with a lot of kids who were delinquents. And the crazy thing is that a kid will become what you expect of them most of the time. So if you look at a kid and you decide, and it's so sad because we see this all the time in our community, kids who grow up and y'all are treated from a young age as losers or pathetic or your parents tell you that you're not going to amount to anything or anything like that, and then you will live up to expectations because that's what kids do. It's like peer pressure. Everyone wants to wear these shoes, you want to wear these shoes too, except there's no material component. People will become what you expect of them because that's what humans do. Right? Everyone else is crying, I'll cry too. Okay, fine. Everyone else is laughing, I'll laugh too. 
So the moment that people start treating a child as lazy, the child will become lazy because the child is being told, hey, I'm lazy, hey, I'm lazy. And the child understands it too. They get it. They're like, oh, all these other people are capable of doing this stuff. I'm not capable of doing this stuff. And the world around is telling me that there is a word for this. That word is lazy. It's not neurodiverse. Because ADHD is both the most overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed psychiatric diagnosis, in my opinion. What this means is a lot of people who don't have it get diagnosed with it. And a lot of people who do have it don't get diagnosed with it. Especially bad for girls, by the way. So the rate of diagnosis is really fascinating. Rate of diagnosis of girls to boys to ADHD is one to three. So for every three boys that is diagnosed with ADHD, girls are one girl is diagnosed. But if you look at the rates of diagnosis amongst men and women, it's one to one. So we're missing a ton of diagnosis in young girls. Why? Because girls are not as hyperactive. Girls are not as disruptive. Girls are much more internalizing. Girls have so much more external pressure to be good little girls and don't make a disturbance. Whereas boys are rambunctious. So there's a lot of cultural component there too. Gender societal dy dynamics at play as well. But the key thing to keep in mind is that if you treat a child like they're lazy, if you tell them they're lazy, if you tell them you just need to work harder. I was told that every single teacher con or conference that I had, every single one, I'm not talking, that's not even an exaggeration. Literally every single one when I was in school, the teacher would say the same thing every fucking time. Your son is so smart. If he just applied himself, he would do so much better. If he just worked harder. So I remember my, my piano teacher told me the same thing, which is that if he practiced, he'd be great. And so then what would happen? My parents would turn to me and they'd say, you need to practice more. And I'd say, okay, mommy, daddy, I will practice. But I did not know how to restrain my attention. Practicing felt so boring because when you practice, you don't actually make music. You make noise. There's no reward. And so it's impossible for me to practice. What could I practice? Street Fighter 2. That's easy to practice. Fucking A. I can practice that shit all day long. I remember there was one day where I spent four hours practicing how to do a Shoryuken. For those of y'all that are familiar with Street Fighter 2. It used to be, now it's easy. But back in the day, it used to be a very hard physical combination to pull off. It's forward, down, down, right, diagonally, and then you take your pick. And I practiced for four hours. And at the beginning of the day, I didn't know how to do a short. You can, by the end, I could do it with 99% proficiency. Because each time you do a short, you can, you hear that super manly, sure, you can. I was like, fuck yeah, let's go, son. Yeah. Right? And it's such a powerful, it's like, oh my God, my fucking character is like flying into the air with his fist in the air. Whereas if I try to practice piano, what happens? Nothing. It's just torture. It's torture. There's no benefit, no advantage, none whatsoever. This is what happens in ADHD. It is impossible to do something unless there is an immediate reward. Without help, that is. We'll get to, it's not, you're not screwed for life, okay? So let's move on. Okay. So. Um, we'll get to this in a second. Spends weeks preparing for small tasks. This goes to this. Okay. So now, this we kind of did. This we kind of did. So let's talk about a couple others. Okay. So writes reminders and doesn't read them. So this is where we get to actually like treatment and options for ADHD. See, what happens when we have ADHD is that we look at the rest of the world and we try to think like we look at what other people are doing and we try to implement those solutions. So the person with ADHD, this is the sequence of events, okay? The first thing is the person with ADHD realizes that they have a bad memory. They forget. And so what they say is they say, okay, I'll write myself a reminder. And that'll help me remember. But there are a couple of problems with this. The first is that you have to remember to read your reminders. And they don't do that. 
So they can write reminders is very easy. They're like, oh, I'll like remember to read this later. But then they don't actually read the reminder. They need a reminder for the reminder. Second thing is that the writing of a reminder, let's understand this. When you write a reminder, what is reinforced? Absolutely nothing. There's no dopaminergic reinforcement when you write the reminder. The value of the reminder is in the future. Delayed gratification, T3, which is five days later, you have this reminder, which you've forgotten. There's no thing. So no reinforcement. Doesn't work. Works for neurotypical people because they are capable of remembering the reminder. And when you remember the reminder and you look at the reminder, then you have you take the action, you get the reward. But the reward is five days later than when you wrote the reminder. So the, the doesn't get reinforced. Does this make sense? This is crazy. It's a beautiful example of all the things that go wrong in ADHD. So there's no immediate reinforcement. You have to remember to read the reminder, which you can't do, right? Because memory is a problem in the first place. We'll get to that in a second. So no reinforcement, difficulty remembering. Third thing is we can't form the habit because we're not consistent. So this is why writing reminders for people with ADHD is a beautiful solution that works incredibly well if you have the scaffolding to do it. So let's understand this. This is where treatment of ADHD comes in. So what is psychotherapy for ADHD? It is a set of cognitive skills that are trained in people that so that you have this scaffolding to lay down the habit. And once you have the system in place, then it yields a lot of benefit. See, this is very important to understand. Building a habit for someone like with ADHD is like digging a well for water. The first nine feet you dig is effort with no reward. The 10th foot and you suddenly have a ton of water. You have as much water as you want to. The last foot is worth infinite water. The first nine feet are worth zero water. This is what building a habit is like. This is why it's hard. So if you can get to that point of having a system that gives you reminders, using a calendar, and a lot of people that I've worked with with ADHD do this, right? So they, by, by hook or by crook, with a ton of effort, sometimes they're lucky enough to develop some kind of habit that really works for them, some kind of external organizational system that really works for them. The problem is that most of us are capable of digging a 10-foot well, and we're okay waiting for the water. With ADHD, you'll dig one foot over here, You'll move away, you'll dig in two feet over there, you'll dig three feet in another place. So what's happening? You're expending a ton of effort. You're actually digging 40 feet, but not in one place. So this is how we get to this. All right, we've kind of talked about this already, but gets nothing done all day and still, still feels overwhelmed and exhausted. So let's talk about this for a second. Gets nothing done and still feels overwhelmed and exhausted. What exhausts you? What exhausts you is effort. And if you pay attention to someone who has ADHD, they may get nothing done, but it isn't that they're not doing anything all day. In fact, quite the opposite. What happens with someone with ADHD is they are wrestling with their mind all day long. This is what they're doing. And wrestling with your mind, the exertion of willpower, is one of the things that is very cognitively draining. So they're actually digging 40 feet of wells just on a dozen different tasks, right? And this is what the experience of someone with ADHD is. You have so much stuff to do. Everything needs to get done because you're so behind. So I got to do this, and 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 oh no, I started this, but I forgot about this, and now I need to go grocery shopping, now I need to do this, and now I need to check the mail. So you're actually expending a ton of effort, but nothing gets finished. And then every time you switch tasks, there is a warming up to the task again. So like you can't pick it up exactly where you left off because your memory isn't very good. So you don't remember what part of this have I done and what part of this have I not done. I need to like, takes, takes me a day or two to like get back into it. Like what, what do I need to do again? Because you forgot to do it. So this is the experience of people with ADHD. It's very, very challenging. Right? And you continue to get judged because people don't judge the effort that you put in. This is the big irony. If you've got ADHD, chances are you're working the hardest out of any of your peers. 
But that's not what you get judged for. You get judged for what gets complete, not how, how hard you work. And this is what's so damaging to people. See, if someone is doing everything and they get judged for the opposite, this really fucks people up. So if you're actually working really hard and people call you lazy, that discordance is so psychologically damaging. If you're actually a good person, so I see this a lot in trauma. There's like a kid who's like a good kid, but their parents teach them that they are a bad kid. So we'll see this a lot with things like, you know, hyper-religiosity and sexuality and, and some of these things where like, you know, people are taught that they are bad even though they're good. And this really messes people up because now up is down and down is up. It's very hard to go through life when up is down and down is up. So the big irony is kids with ADHD work way harder. That's why everything is so exhausting. But they're taught that they're lazy. And so now if you've defined hard work as lazy, what chance do you possibly have? Screwed. Okay? So, let's take a look at a couple of other things. So, chugs gallon of caffeine. So, this makes sense. Okay? Because chugging a gallon of caffeine or any other kind of psychoactive substance results in such an immediate effect. We become dependent on it. So exercising, taking a walk in the morning that has these things have lingering effects, even eating a proper breakfast has such a slow onset of action that the behavior doesn't get reinforced. Chugging a gallon of caffeine, and by the way, like drug companies understand this very well because this is why they make stimulant medication. So that's really fascinating. So if you look at the studies on stimulant versus non-stimulant medication, we've got medications like bupropion or adamoxetine, and then we have medications like methylphenidate, and um, amphetamine salts. So some are stimulants and some are not stimulants. If you look at the outcomes on medication, so if I give people non-stimulant medication and stimu or stimulant medication, they tend to do just as well in life. The outcomes are the same. Why do people love stimulants if they've got ADHD? Because they feel the effect immediately. And since they can notice an immediate difference, there's a lot more reinforcement of that medication. And drug companies understand this very well, right? So what they try to do is they try to give you something that subjectively makes you feel better. Same difference with benzodiazepines and anti-anxiety medications like SSRIs or SNRIs. So benzodiazepines activate the same receptor as alcohol, GABA receptor. They have an immediate effect, which makes them more addictive and patients really want it. The SSRI or SNRI yields the same clinical benefit over the course of two months, but people don't feel it subjectively as much. So this is very important to understand. So the more immediate the benefit is, the easier it is to reinforce an ADHD. Okay? Now, let's talk about this. Mm, can't regulate emotions. So this is another thing to understand. So in ADHD, there's a, let me see if I can find this. Um, so let's just, uh, I'll just show you all. So there's a bunch of papers on this, but we can just look at it here. Reject optional cookies. Fuck no cookies, dude. Are you kidding? So is emotional dysregulation part of the psychopathology of ADHD in adults? Um, so empirical studies attest this dimension sufficient uh, uh, this dimension sufficient reliability and validity. Symptoms of emotional dysregulation are definable and seem to be distinct factors of the psychopathology of adult ADHD. Let's just look at another one. Emotional dysregulation is a primary symptom in adult deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? Dysfunctional emotion regulation significantly contributes to impairment in several domains with ADHD. There's even a, let's try subtype. Um, there's a good paper here. 
that I can't find now. So there's there's some there there's some people, like researchers, who have actually hypothesized that you know how we have ADD and ADHD, so attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so some people have hypothesized that there is a third subtype of ADHD that is or ADD that is attention deficit disorder with emotional dysregulation. And so emotional dysregulation is a huge part of ADHD. So people with ADHD feel especially negative emotions much more quickly, more intensely. So the onset of action is more rapid. The intensity of the emotion is more rapid and the duration of the emotion is longer. So what, let's understand this. We have this part of our brain called the amygdala in our limbic system, which is our negative emotion, our emotional circuitry. And remember that in ADHD, we have executive function deficits. We have control deficits in our frontal lobes. So control deficits in our frontal lobes lead to things like impulsivity if we're looking at the relationship between the nucleus accumbens and the frontal lobes. So for a nucleus accumbens is like, I want it. Give it to me. Let's do it. That's nucleus accumbens. We have trouble controlling that if we have ADHD. But that's not the only thing that the frontal lobe controls. It also restrains our negative emotions. So emotional dysregulation is a huge problem for people with ADHD. And the reason that this is a big problem is not just that they have this neuroscientific deficit, but that our society assumes a certain level of emotional regulation capability. We assume a neurotypical emotional regulation problem. And so what tends to happen is when people have difficulty regulating their emotions, we do not support them in teaching them emotional regulation skills. We just tell them that they need to do it, right? So this is the big problem is unlike someone who's missing a leg, where we're like, hey, friend, since you're missing a leg, we will do things like build ramps for you. We will do things like provide you with a wheelchair. We will do things like provide you with a prosthetic so that we can correct your deficiency and you can participate in something of a normal life. And when we do that for people who are missing limbs, they're capable of living relatively normal lives. They still have challenges. We're not saying that. But if we look at the psychological consequences, these people can do things like hold jobs. They can get married. They can have kids if that's what they want to do. They can go on vacation. They can get on planes. We have so many accommodations for people with physical handicaps. We have very few accommodations or arguably no, uh, very few accommodations for people with mental handicaps. And that too is such, especially on platforms like what we stream, ha <laughs> ha, mental handicap. <laughs> we use that term so in such a derogatory way, right? So these people are neurodiverse. Their brains are wired in a slightly different way. They're not capable of the same things at default. And so we must make accommodations for them. And accommodations doesn't mean that we want to make everything in their life easier. We want to do the work for them. This means that we want to help train their brains in the way that they need to compensate for the way things are. Right? It's just like even if we look at something like red, green, color blindness, we have video games now that have colorblind friendly modes. Like that's cool. That's what we need for ADHD as well. We need ways to build habits. We need ways of behavioral reinforcement that account for these things. Ways to regulate emotions that account for these things. But we don't. And so the problem is that people suffer because standard solutions don't work, right? It's like someone without legs and we're just telling them, hey, bro or girl, climb stairs, just climb stairs. And it's like, you can do it, right? If you've got no legs, you can go up a flight of stairs. It's doable. It's just going to be exhausting. To climb one flight of stairs is going to be so exhausting. And this is what happens with our cognitive, the cognitive world that we live in. We assume that people can deal with reminders. We assume that people's attention is capable of being focused. So we have some one-hour boring-ass meeting. And even if we know it's a boring-ass meeting, we're expecting people to be able to pay attention to some degree. Torture for someone with ADHD. Absolute torture. And so this is the problem that we create. And then what we end up with is this. When everything 
comes to pass, we end up with can't trust your own judgment. Because of all of these other failures, you lose confidence in yourself. So then what we've really done, now this is kind of like the last nail in the coffin. So as we mentioned, people with ADHD can sometimes grow up to be depressed. But see, once you lose confidence in yourself, the fundamental unit of agency in your life is gone. So if we look at a human being's capacity to deal with adversity, the most powerful thing we can have is confidence. Confidence is what determines whether something is a setback or a failure. And the child with ADHD, the young adult, the adult with ADHD, concludes that I cannot trust myself. And now you're in big trouble. Because a big part of life is trusting yourself. Why? Because you can trust in other people, but other people are not 100% you. See, if you are, don't trust your own taste in food and you look around at what other people are enjoying, you can still get some enjoyment. But to have the perfect meal, you need to look into yourself. You need to ask yourself, what do I enjoy? That's the way to get a perfect meal. It isn't to find what someone else is eating and enjoy that. But this is what happens. Then they lose the capacity to trust their own judgment, their own confidence. And now I've lost a, a very fundamental barometer or thermometer or measurement stick for my life. Because if you think about anything in life, you can get the best advice in the world. You can have people make food for you. You can have people pick out clothing for you. You can have people pick video games for you. You can have people pick all kinds of stuff. You can do things and you can do it pretty well. You can look at reviews, you can look at this, you can look at advice. But at the end of the day, your life comes down to you. You have to decide for yourself what you like, what you don't like, what works, what doesn't work. And when you lose the capacity to trust yourself, you will become directionless in life. What this looks like is that you are constantly looking outside for answers, but those answers don't translate 100% to you. So you're looking for another answer and another answer and another answer. And then you get to this conclusion that nothing works for me. Works for all these other people, but none of these solutions. I've seen this so many times. I've had people come into my office. I've seen 10 psychiatrists. Nothing works. I'm hopeless. So they come to me and they're like, you do this weird alternative medicine stuff, maybe you can fix me. And I'm like, fuck, I can't fix you. If you've seen 10 psychiatrists, why do you think I'm smarter than they are? I'm not. This, if you want to fix your life and you've gone to 10 different people for help, if you tried everything under the sun, there's one, only one place left to go, which is towards yourself. Because other people's solutions don't work for you. We've already determined that. And when that person comes into my office and says, I've tried 10 other people, maybe you can help me. There's one way in which I can help them. And this is what determines whether this person gets better or not, which is, can I teach this person? Can I help this person reconnect with themselves and find their own solutions? Because I... there are people who are better than me that have already tried and they've failed. There's no way that I can succeed. The answer has to come from you. And this is the real tragedy, the paradox, the irony, call it whatever you want to is that we take these kids with ADHD and we tr teach them to distrust themselves. And then it becomes almost impossible. So if we look at psychotherapy for ADHD, what do we do? So when I have a patient who comes in with ADHD, I also in the back of my mind am focusing on depression treatment until proven otherwise. Trauma treatment until proven otherwise. These three things, addiction treatment until proven otherwise. So anytime someone comes into my office with ADHD, these are the three additional diagnoses that I am very vigilant for because chances are there's some element of addiction, depression, and trauma in this person's life. And the research backs that up, by the way. This isn't, you know, just me randomly coming up with things because I see it. Because unlike... Growing up without legs, we don't have a society that accommodates people with ADHD. You can get extra time on tests. whoop do fucking do Shocking. I'm going to tell you all something crazy. Okay? There's also a gendered component to ADHD, which I'm working on a video on. So if we look at people who get divorced, 
60% of women with ADHD, oh, sorry, men, this is going to sound bad. I'm just trying to remember the exact phrasing. Women with ADHD have a 60% likelihood to get divorced from their partner because of their ADHD. 10% of men are likely to get divorced from their partner because of their ADHD. So we haven't even scratched the surface of a lot of these consequences. What does that mean? I'm not saying that women have it worse than men. Please don't make that kind of, I mean, we're just talking about statistics here. Okay. What this means is that a lot of the societal expectations of women are impossible to meet or very difficult to meet if you have ADHD. Very simple thing. Women are expected to keep the house organized. They're expected to take care of the kids, pack the lunches. These things become incredibly difficult with ADHD. The basic things that we societally expect from women become very difficult. So women with ADHD are much more likely to go through divorce than, than men. And why is it? It's because of this. This is what the research suggests, right? I'm not saying that men have it easier. Please do not. So the, I've noticed the, this tendency in this community where when I say make a statement, people will jump to a very black and white way of thinking. Please don't do that. Right. And this happens when I talk about how men would men kill themselves and then people will get upset and they'll say that. But women struggle with suicide, too. Yes, I'm not. <laughs> in my experience as a psychiatrist, I don't think one gender has it way easier than the other. It's just we're all fucked in different ways. And the right answer is that we should have compassion for all people for the difficulties that they have. And when it comes to a diagnosis, there are gender-specific manifestations of a diagnosis. It's not all the same. Men and women don't live equal lives. They, we all experience the world in a very different way, and we have our own unique challenges. It is our job to look at the data and understand in what ways this particular disease process manifests in a gendered way, in a cultural way. Because human beings have separate lives. And if we want to help all people, we need to understand the societal expectations and pressures for both men and women. All right, so I'm working on two videos right now. One is about how men's anxiety is very different from anxiety and how women's ADHD is very different from ADHD. It's very interesting. So there are even some trials that show that stimulant medication does not improve symptoms for women. Crazy, crazy, crazy. There's a couple of trials. And why? Because stimulant medication is very effective at treating hyperactivity, but women are much less likely to be hyperactive. Okay. So, yeah, if you guys here. Okay. So just to kind of summarize. See, when we look at this kind of stuff, we can look at this stuff. All this stuff I think is very accurate. Now, even though I'm sort of talking doom and gloom, there's one very important thing to remember. If we want to fix a problem, we have to understand it. We have to understand how it happens. So please don't take what I'm saying as a feature of hopelessness. And this is where I think this is, I, I don't know that Dr. Barkley was saying this, but he says it's impossible. I, I, I mean, I don't think that's actually what he means. I, I don't think he thinks that ADHD is a hopeless diagnosis. I think we know that there are evidence-based interventions. But we have to start by understanding what the problem is. And the biggest problem in ADHD is misdiagnosis. When people tell you to work harder or just wake up on time or use sticky notes to remind yourself, people come with, up with all of these solutions. The reason they don't work is because they are solutions to different problems. The problems that someone with ADHD has are different. And so we need tailored solutions to those problems, things that neurotypical people will never even think of. So chances are one of my kids is somewhere once again on the ADHD spectrum. She inherited my good genes. And so the things that I have to teach her as a parent are things that I would never have thought to teach. They seem so simple and basic. 
right? So for, for example, I'll ask my daughter. Let's say we're talking about reminders. And so the, what I find is that to really work with someone with ADHD, you have to do two or three additional steps to translate a neurotypical solution for a neurodiverse person. So if we take something like writing a sticky note. So if I, I'll say, okay, you can write a reminder, but then I have to go two steps further. I have to ask her, what do we do with reminders? What's the purpose of a reminder? And then she's like kind of confused and she's like, to remind me? And I say, yes, that is very good. What makes it hard for us to remember sticky notes? How are you going to remember to read a sticky note? And she's like, make a sticky note to remember my sticky note? I said, very good. How are you going to remember to remember your sticky note? And she's like, make another sticky note? I'm confused. This isn't going to work. And I'm like, abso fucking lutely. I don't say fucking because she's six. This is not going to work. Take a deep breath. Now let's figure out what do you think will work? Okay, let's put the sticky note. Let's forget about the sticky note entirely as a reminder. What we're going to do is we're going to take the back of your door to your schoolroom. And we're going to put all of your sticky notes on the back of the door. And the first thing that you need to do when you come home every single day is look at the back of the door. The whole system has to be made for her. She needs help making it. Right? So what's the first thing that we do when we come home? We're going to put our snack away. We're going to go to the back of the door and we're going to see what's written on there. You have to bake this. You have to teach them how to bake the system. Does that make sense? So this is what's missing in ADHD. This is what ADHD treatment is. Is teaching people these kinds, it's providing scaffolding so that you can thrive. So it's not hopeless, but we need customized solutions. We need neurodiverse solutions. And so a lot of people in our community have been awesome at figuring this stuff out. People will, you know, share with their experiences. That's awesome. We have a whole guide about ADHD where we go into these things. You know, step by step, what are the things that you need to do? What, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the difficulties? How are things different for you? You have to understand all of this stuff. And then the beautiful thing is that once you figure some of this stuff out, then things start to change. This begins to change. Right? This begins to change. This begins to change. Instead of defaulting to solutions that work for other people, we're going to develop solutions that work for us. Okay? I'm a male with inattentive type. Does that mean that stimulants won't work for me? So that's a question for you and a clinician. What I'm simply saying is that there are some studies, I can think of two, that demonstrate, I mean, when I say I can think of two, let me just, let's just look at them together. Why think? And there's a, I'm, I'm working on a video on this, so we'll go over this in more detail, but let's see. Uh... I think this is the one. Okay. Um, give me a second. So I'll just, sh let's just look at this together. Okay, chat. So stimulant treatment for females. Okay, so a large variation has been reported in response to treatment with efficacy ranging from 25% to 78%, which is much different than the fairly consistently reported 70% range of response for, uh, in children. Okay, 
So this is like really interesting. So like if you look at studies on women, like the range is 25 to 78 percent. And if you look at like most trials on the efficacy of medication, it's somewhere around 70 percent. Um, right. So uh, as noted in the previous section, girls seem to respond optimally when medication is combined with behavioral interventions. Um some differences in stimulant response have been found for the inattentive type versus the combined type. So, like, w we're not sure, right? So that, that's the main thing. Is like we're all operating under this idea that for girls, that ADHD stimulant medication is, like, 70% effective. Most people are not aware that the range is 25 to 78%. Like, that's shocking. That's a very different treatment response. But, uh, you know, I, I think this kind of specificity is, like, not, we're not really aware of it. It's crazy. Um, nope, I'm reading everything. <laughs> okay. Um... Okay. Shall we move on, chat? So we did a lot of stuff on ADHD. Let us, I want to close the tab. Close. Close multiple tabs to the right. There we go. All right. Mm, give me a sec, chat. Let's just check in with what people are saying, thinking, doing. Damn it. That took longer than I expected. Um, hmm. Okay, so I think people wanted to do five hours into a walk, right? <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm going to go pee real quick, raw quack. So y'all can take a look at this. We're going to talk about this as soon as I get back. Chat. Okay, so why does this always happen after a good head clearing walk? Five hours into the walk, my potential knows no bounds. I will accomplish greater feats than anyone before me. I will uncover every last secret of the universe. I will experience every possible emotion and never die. I will turn my life around the moment I get home. And 10 minutes after getting home, you're like, damn, why does this happen? Why is it then when we're walking, when we're thinking about all the changes we're going to make in our lives, we're like, oh man, like I'm going to turn things around first thing tomorrow, right? We look at the future and we say, I'm going to change. And when it comes around to it, it's hard to change. And we say to ourselves, oh my God, I'm so lazy. It's not laziness. And what y'all will find is that if you're, if you're kind of like this, you'll find that there's a lot of struggles that we have. 
where we kind of will think like, okay, like I'm going to finally make some friends. I'm going to put myself out there. And then the moment that you try to put yourself out there, you feel very socially anxious. You're like, I'm going to go home. And then you say to yourself one day, okay, I'm going to finally get in shape. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do this. And then you think about going to the gym and you're like, nah, I'm not going to do that. So if you look at life, a lot of people struggle to do this stuff. And there are some people who seem to not struggle as much, right? Have y'all noticed this, that like sometimes you look at people who are like doing it all? It's like, I have a family member and she's just absolutely amazing. She's an amazing mother. She runs her own business, is lots of fun, plans trips, is like learning new things, is always available to help people. She's like some kind of superwoman. I'm like, how on earth, how is this person able to do this? And we come up with these ideas like resilience. Like some people, are, some people are more resilient than others. It's like, how do you become resilient? Right? Like, how does this work? How is it that some people are capable of so many of these things and other people don't seem to be capable of many of them at all? So let's understand this. So if you look at people who tend to be stuck, and unable to follow through with things. There are a couple of very important principles to understand. Today, we're going to focus on one called ambivalence. So ambi means both, and valent is like direction. So when we tend to approach our lives, we tend to have some kind of internal conflict. And the biggest mistake that most people who don't progress make is that they don't focus on their ambivalence. What we try to do anytime we have warring parts, we try to have one person, one side win, right? So let's take a classic example of, should I break up with this person or not? And what everyone will tell you to do is make a pros and cons list. Write all your pros over here and all your cons over here, and then look at the list. And then the answer will become clear. And then you make the decision and then you stick to it. But that's not how it works, right? Because you make the pros and cons list and you're like, okay, there are 16 pros and there are four cons. Let's just use another example. Let's make a pro and con list about playing video games all day long. Pros, it's fun. Cons, it's bad for my health, bad for my career, bad for my relationship, bad for my making friends in the real world bad for my fashion, bad for my back, bad for my skin, bad for what I eat. But the pros, it's a lot of fun. But it's not even a lot of fun all the time. Like sometimes like I don't even know why I'm doing it. Like pro con list. So we look at these pro con lists and we make a decision. And this is our mistake. The biggest mistake that we make is that we assume that making a decision is going to fix anything. That's not what happens. So if we look at our actual experience, we decide one thing today, and then we do this thing called change our minds, right? So you make a decision today, and tomorrow you make the opposite decision. And so then we start to think to ourselves, I need to focus on, I need to follow through. I need to learn commitment and discipline. We need to focus on his ambivalence. So I'm going to read something to you all. So this is a great book called Motivation and Interviewing, and it's helping people change. So when I was a first-year medical student, I had a family medicine professor who was teaching us about helping patients. So family medicine is kind of like a general practitioner or primary care physician. Super interesting guy. So he would do this thing. So he, he recommended this book, or not maybe it was part of his class. So he's teaching us how to like do some basic doctoring. And he had some pretty hot takes. One of his hot takes is that di type 2 diabetes, obesity, and arthritis, all of these are behavioral problems. So he was like telling us that, you know, we have all these drugs for things like type 2 diabetes. But it is amazing what kind of drugs we will develop that allow people to not change their behavior. We will bend over so, we will advance science so far just so people don't have to change what they do. We will enable such terrible behavior with advancements in medical science. 
So he told me this when I was a first year medical student, thought really stuck with me. And he was like, diabetes is not, uh, type 2 diabetes is not a, a disease of endocrinology. It is a disease of behavior. And we as doctors don't focus on that. And this really crystallized for me a few years later when I was on my vascular surgery rotation. And I had a patient come in who was getting her third or fourth amputation. So literally what would happen, she had a surgeon who knew her very well. And the surgeon before surgery said, you know we're going to keep doing this until you quit smoking, right? And she was like, yeah, doctor, I know. I'm so sorry. So she had lost one leg below the knee. And then he was doing uh, the second removal of certain toes on her feet. He was like taking off chunks of her feet every couple years. And his intervention was, you know we're going to keep doing this until you quit smoking, right? And she was like, yes, doctor, I know. And then he amputated her foot. Crazy. So controlling your behavior is paramount. And this is what I love about this book. So I think it beautifully explains the core problem with making a decision. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. Yet ambivalence can also be a sticky place where one may remain suspended for a long time. The dynamics of conflict make this dilemma understandable. Conceptually, ambivalent conflict comes in four different varieties. All of them involve being simultaneously pushed or pulled in at least two opposite directions. The more, and here's the key thing, the more you move toward one choice, the clearer its disadvantages become and the more its opposite appeals. So here's the basic problem with making a decision. See, when I'm in the middle, I look over here and I see some advantages and some disadvantages. And I look over here and I see some advantages and some disadvantages. And we look at these pros and cons and we make a decision. But as I start to move in this direction, the disadvantages become more clear and potent and the advantages on the other side become more advantageous. The grass is always greener on the other side. The idea of going to the gym has certain pros and certain cons. The moment I actually go to the gym, the cons become way higher and the pros become way smaller. And then the pros of the opposite side become way more attractive. And then I move in that direction and then the cons become bigger. So see, the basic problem that we have is that we are looking for our lives to be easy. We are looking for some kind of resolution from a decision, right? So when I'm looking at this idea, oh, like all of these are wonderful ideas, but the moment that I start, I will turn my around the moment I get home. This is in the future. And the moment that you get home, the prospect of actually turning your life around comes with such larger disadvantages than when you were just thinking about it and far away. See, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Downsides to your behavior become seem very, very far away until you get close to them. This is the problem. So the basic mistake that we make is that we look at pros and cons and we make a decision. And we assume that our decision is like beneficial, right? So this is kind of makes sense. Like we have pros over here, we have cons over here, and then we're going to decide something based on a net positive. And we think we're going to move in that direction. But the whole problem is that the equation changes as we implement it. And since the disadvantages become bigger and the advantages seem further away, then we move in the opposite direction. So we go from plus one and we're like, shit, this is bad. Then we run towards zero and we head towards minus one. And then as we head towards minus one, the disadvantages become bigger. And the advantages, oh, the plus one weren't, weren't so bad. So let me run back in that direction. So we're not paralyzed, we're conflicted. And it's not actually paralysis. It's not inaction. It is reversed action. I'm going to break up with you. Let's get back together. We need to break up. This is crazy. This is terrible. I miss you. Conflict. Right? Because once you break up with someone, then the pain of them being the, 
uh, uh, being absent is so much more acute. You begin to realize all the things that you took for granted in the relationship. And then when you get back together with, you're like, oh my God, I miss this person. So, then you get back together and all the fucking toxic behaviors are in your face again. They're nagging you all the time, putting you down in front of your friends. They're cheap and all this other crap. So it's whichever direction we go starts to feel more painful. So if you look at people who are capable of doing a lot of things and people who are not capable of very much, they struggle with one group struggles with ambivalence. One group is very good at ambivalence, dealing with ambivalence. And this, by the way, is the foundation of our coaching program is motivational interviewing and behavioral change, right? So this is what we try to really focus on is how it's not about giving people answers. It's about helping them work through, acknowledge their conflict and how to move forward in spite of things being difficult, not trying to make things easy. So how do you overcome ambivalence? It's very, very, very simple. You just accept that whatever direction you're going to go, things are not going to get easier. They're going to get harder. See, anytime we're looking for a pro-con list, we're looking for some kind of benefit. We're looking for a net gain. Get rid of that idea, and then you'll be able to do whatever you want. Okay? So I'll explain a little bit more because that may sound weird. See, anytime we make a decision... We make that decision assuming that things will get better. We are trying to make a decision to improve our situation. So if I'm stuck at home and I'm lonely, I need to make the pain of this loneliness go away. So I'm moving towards something with the idea that this will make my life better. But as we just discovered, the problem with ambivalence is actually leaving the house becomes so much harder. So as long as you are chasing an attempt to make your life better, you will be stuck in ambivalence. Instead, what you need to do is accept that things are going to be shit. Honestly, that's the answer. Just accept that things are going to be shit. For how long? Who knows? Today, for sure. Accept that things are going to suck today. Tomorrow is tomorrow. What we find with people who are able to really conquer ambivalence is that like, so, so this is oftentimes used in addiction treatment, right? So this is, that's really where I learned motivational interviewing. And if you kind of talk to people like, yeah, like, I mean, there's going to be advantages one day <laughs> if you stop smoking or drinking or whatever, but today your life is going to suck, right? Not drinking means a return to social anxiety. Not drinking means finding a new set of friends. Not drinking means suffering more today because drinking helps with that. So the key thing to understand is, first of all, any decision you make is a temporary decision. That's number one. There's no like final mathematical logical equation that will determine your behavior. And we all think there is. We think once I've made a decision, that's it. But that's not true. Just understand that your decision is like it's made of toilet paper. It'll fly away in the wind. And it'll disintegrate underwater. That's just how the decision is. Accept that there's going to be conflict. Accept that you can make one choice today and that this choice may be difficult. So what we tend to do is we try to make a decision to make our life easier. Instead, recognize that it's going to be harder. Second thing that we need to do is anticipate the difficulty. That once, see, if we look at this, look at this. This is positive. 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 We don't think about the negatives when we're thinking about our accomplishments. So what we need to start doing is thinking about the negatives, even dwelling on the negatives. So I will turn my life around the moment I get home. This is what I want you all to do. For any goal that you want to accomplish, you should ask yourself, what's going to make this hard? How will this feel when I actually do it? And we don't like doing that because we like to give in to our positive, the positive valence, right? So ambivalence is there's positive and negative. And we like to just focus on the positive, focus on the positive, focus on the positive. There's so much positive stuff there. And then what happens, the reality is very different from what we construct in our head. There's no acknowledgement of the negative. 
And so then the negative ambushes us, and then we end up staying stuck. Not really stuck, bouncing back and forth. We're a pendulum. And a pendulum never gets anywhere. It just... It never gets anywhere. That's what we are. We're pendulums, and the secret is ambivalence. So think about what's going to make what's going to be difficult. Accept that things are going to be difficult today. Don't even try to run away from them. Accept it. There are a couple of other things that we really do that's that's very helpful. Other cognitive exercises that y'all can do, just that anytime you're moving towards degeneracy, play the tape through to the end. So when we think about make anytime we make a bad decision, let's say I decide that I'm going to play video games today. What I need to do is play that tape through to the end. These are cognitive things that we don't do. If I play video games today, how am I going to feel an hour from now? How am I going to feel tonight? And what am I going to feel tomorrow? See, if you really pay attention, anytime you procrastinate, you're trying very hard not to think. You're trying to avoid thinking. Your mind tries to forget and so you forget very intentionally, and then you wake up the next day, and then life reminds you. And then you suffer. And then you beat yourself up from yesterday. But you knew this was going to happen. If I asked you, how are you going to, if you play video games today, uh, how are you going to feel tomorrow? You're going to say, I'm going to feel like shit. You know that. I know that. Your mind intentionally tries to escape. So the challenge that we have is we don't know how our mind works, and we're not dealing with it in the right way. The other really crazy thing is that as you start embracing the difficult, your life will get so much better, not worse. So this is something that's very important to understand. We think that an easy life makes our life easy. Actually, an easy life makes our life hard. A hard life makes our life easy, which doesn't make any fucking sense. So let me explain. See, the reason that we want an easy life, so people who want an easy life are frequently, not all the time, it's not like one-to-one, -one, maybe let's say 51%. A lot of times people who want an easy life lack confidence in themselves. So a lot of people will ask me, Dr. K, how do I boost my confidence? And the way to boost your confidence is not through success, it's through difficulty. It's not even about failure or success, it's about difficulty. There's one very simple principle that I think we don't quite understand. So I'm going to read you all something that I think is really cool. So there's this really great story about a young girl named Sumati. And Sumati is an eight-year-old girl who is a disciple of the Buddha. And one day she goes up to the Buddha, and he's on a mountain somewhere, and he's teaching. And she asks him, how does someone become happy? And the Buddha gives her ten tenets to become happy. And this is one of the things that he says. When working, you wish to do what is hard. When living with others, you wish to live with those who are difficult. If a task is difficult, do it without hesitation. Doing so shows what we are capable of undertaking. So this is a very, very beautiful concept from 10 Paths to Happiness. See, we don't know what we're capable of as long as we're living easy lives. And so if we don't know what we're capable of, we will be filled with self-doubt. Confidence comes from understanding and believing in yourself. But how can you understand who you are? So one time I played in a charity tournament. I played in this Dota 2 charity tournament. And I'm a shitty player when it comes to Dota 2. I'm not very good. I may be at like 40th to 50th percentile. So my rank is poor. But when I was playing in this charity tournament, I was playing against, I was playing like with professional players and streamers and stuff like that. So these people are just like, you know, top 1%, top 0.001%. And I played the best goddamn Dota of my life. Like I was like playing on a completely different level. And it's like, until we are tested, we don't know what we're capable of. What you're capable of is not shown when things are easy. What you're capable of is when things are hard. The problem is that we run away from that. We run away from difficulty. We have food delivery. We have instant downloads. 
We have, I want this kind of thing to take care of this. I want a reminder to take care of this. I want some kind of life hack to fix this problem. I'm going to take this supplement so I don't have to deal with anxiety. I'm going to do this so I don't, I can, it's easier for me to sleep. Our whole lives are trying to make our lives easy, make our lives easy, make our lives easy. And we go on making our lives more and more difficult because we have no confidence in ourselves. So I want y'all to think about when did, when was a moment in time where you really respected who you are? I can bet you a lot of money that it was not when things were easy. It's when things are hard and you found yourself capable. And even if you didn't find yourself capable, you may still feel good about it. So when it comes to ambivalence, what we really need to do is embrace the difficulty. Don't try to make your life easy. And when your life, when there's no difference between easy and hard, then your life will be under your control. Because as long as you are running away from difficulty, then what you do in life is dictated by whether it's hard or whether it's easy. And we all say, I want to be capable of doing something hard. You strive for that. You want that. Why don't you do it? Because you're afraid of failure. You can do hard things now. But that's not, that's not what you want. It's not about hard. It's hard with success. And so what the Buddha told Sumati and what we understand about ambivalence is just accept that it's going to be difficult today. Don't try to make it easy. Don't do your pros and cons list and then do the thing that's the pro thinking it's going to be easy because it's not. This is a fundamental psychological aspect of human behavior. That the moment that you're sitting in neutral and you pick a direction and you move in that direction, the disadvantages grow. And so if our goal is to run away from disadvantage, that's when we're going to become a pendulum. Moving all the time, expending a lot of energy, and getting nowhere. It's not paralysis. It's contradictory behavior. And this is what ambivalence is. We have conflict. And we want to make one decision. You're, you're, it's impossible to make one decision. You will always be of two minds. That's a feature of evolution. So stop trying to make it easy on yourself. Why do we want to make a decision? Just think about that for a second. The reason we want a decision is because we want to be free from the mental conflict. I want to figure out what the right thing is to do because then it'll be easy. I want to figure out, I want to life hack my way to success. I want to find work that I love. Therefore, I won't expend effort. I want to get paid doing something that I love. That will, therefore, my life will be easy. And we give ourselves this kind of advice. Right? Find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. This is running away from difficulty. And then people will say the opposite. Turn what you love into a job and you'll hate it for the rest of your life. Which one do I do? You move perpendicularly. Abandon the access. Just accept that life is hard. Accept that your life is going to be difficult. Accept that there's no way to get out of this situation. You can just do the best that you can, and it sucks for you. I'll give you all one last example of this. So I met someone recently, super interesting guy. Surgical resident. So I don't know if you all know much about the lives of surgical residents. They work on average six days a week. Oftentimes, the day off that they have is actually like a post-call day sometimes. So what that means is that they work 24 hours, and then they're off. Like, they'll work from, like, let's say, Friday morning to Saturday morning, and their day off will be Saturday. <laughs> they just work for 24 hours. And they have to be back at the hospital on Sunday. So surgical residents usually work very hard. Thankfully, here in the United States, they get some degree of mandated vacation, which is somewhere around three weeks. And this guy spends one out of his three weeks of vacation a year working six days a week. Or, so he works six days a week, and one of, one of the three weeks of vacation, he spends doing volunteer work. So he flies to a different location and does volunteer work for one week. This is a vacation. And I was like, bro, you're crazy. <laughs> It's like you only get three weeks a year. Like I can understand if you know you got like five weeks a year or you were working five days a week. Like I'm all for volunteer work and it's good to help other people. 
And then he was like, actually, like, I find that the more that I do this, like, it doesn't bother me. Like, it doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. Like, I enjoy doing it. Like, I feel like even though I'm tired because I, I, I mean, he works hard when he volunteers too. He doesn't like half ass it. He's working like 16, 18, 20 hours a day when he's volunteering. I'm like, how, who, what is this human? Like, who are you? Are you human? Because it sounds very different from me. There's something beautiful. There's something weird that we don't understand. Like this whole society, we're trying to make our lives so easy, so easy, so easy. And when we make, when we make our lives so easy, we become intolerant of difficulty. And there's something beautiful that you can do, which is to make easy and hard the same in your mind. To not retreat from one and move towards the other. To make them both equal. To not have vacation be vacation work during vacation. It sounds crazy. It sounds absolutely crazy. I'm not saying you need to work at your job and let someone take advantage of you or anything like that. But like I'm saying, like, because he volunteers. But if y'all really want to know how to overcome ambivalence, how to actually go home and do things, it's about the avoidance of difficulty. It's about acknowledging that any goal that I move towards will be harder than I expect it to be. And to prepare for that mentally. This is going to be a mess. Here we go. Right? And you learn this in medicine when, you, or when you're on call for 24 hours. You go into that call knowing that this is going to be shit. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a mess. Hopefully it's on the easier side, but there's no way to get out of this. 24-hour call is 24-hour call. Like You do the best that you can. And the more that you start to live your life like this, the more that you don't try to move towards easy, or even if you pick one direction, you acknowledge that it's going to get more painful before it gets easier. And the big irony is that as you live in this way, your life will get better. It'll get easier. It'll become more fulfilling. You will be more happy and you will be more productive. All of the stuff will come. And the last point that I'll make is you look at the direction that society is moving in. We're making everything easy for ourselves. And you look at what's happening. Happiness is decreasing. Capability is decreasing. Independence is decreasing. Because we're making everything easy. Last, last example. We know this physiologically. How do you become physically stronger? Do you lift light weights or heavy weights? Simple. And yet we don't understand this about the rest of our life. We go on lifting the lightest weights we can find. And then we wonder why we feel so weak all the time. We wonder why we can't lift heavy weights. See, this is the thing. We don't pay attention to ourselves, what actually happens in our lives. So this is actually kind of related. So we'll look at this last post. Dr. K, please explain why this is so true. The night before a day off is actually more satisfying than the actual day off. Weird, right? Very strange. That the anticipation of a day off is more fun than the day off itself. So let's understand something. We aren't taught how to be happy. We aren't taught what happiness is. We're taught ha mathematics. We're taught maybe some social skills if we're lucky. We're taught certain physical activities like maybe basketball or football, soccer, whatever. Right? We're taught how to use computers maybe, tablets, electronics, etc., history. We're taught all kinds of things. But we're not taught, weird thing, we're not taught how to be happy. So the first thing that happens is that 
we think that our happiness comes from our circumstances. And so our strategy in life becomes the avoidance of negative circumstances. So if we sort of think about why is a day off so fun? A day off is so fun because it is not a day of work. Right? So if we sort of look at what excites me, oh my God, I wish I never had to work another day in my life. So what is the nature of our happiness? The nature of our happiness is to avoid things that make us unhappy. Things like work. And so if we sort of like think about the night before a day off, we're very excited because it's a whole day that we don't have to work. Thank God I don't have to work. It's going to be so great. I can do so many things. And then you wake up and the actual day off is not nearly as glorious as what you expected. Sometimes it can be. So the question is why? So this is kind of weird, but like, you know, the absence of a negative thing is not necessarily the same as a positive thing. All the... <laughs> Ooh. All the absence of a negative thing does is move us from negative to zero. It doesn't move us from zero to 10. Does that kind of make sense? So this is where like we start to think that, okay, in life we want to be the source of our unhappiness is work. And so removing that, then I can do whatever I want to. But when the day actually rolls around, we tend to waste it. Because in our mind, the real direction, all the only happiness we can think about is to run away from something painful. It is not a, how to create joy in our lives. We don't know how to do that. Which is why the freedom from work feels so much more happy than the actual day off for some people. So what are the components of happiness? So oftentimes people will regret their day off because they didn't do anything. You wake up, you hop on your phone, you scroll Reddit for a couple of hours, you stretch a little bit, you maybe go get something to eat. It's pretty tasty, like that's kind of a win. And then you kind of go home, maybe you play a little video games, maybe you do this, and then like 4 p.m. rolls around and you're like, ah. I mean, like, none of those individual decisions was bad, but I wasted the day. It's already 4 o'clock, and, like, I don't even do anything. So if we look at one of the key components of happiness, it is intention. To live your life intentionally. So I'll give you all another example. Which is, if you say to yourself, I'm going to have a day off tomorrow, and I'm going to be a wasteful degenerate. Even if you make that an intention, that I'm going to do absolutely nothing. I'm going to try hard to do absolutely nothing. No chores, no this, no this. It is intentional. It isn't reflexive. It is tomorrow I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to try very hard to do nothing. Then you will have a good day. We're going to maximize our degeneracy. This is what a land party is. You guys get that? We can play video games all day long, and we can feel terrible at the end, and we can have a LAN party. LAN party is, has no regret. LAN party is great. What? Why? Why is a LAN party so much more fun than just sitting at home and playing video games on, on your by yourself? Maybe there's a social component, sure, but it, what it really is is the intentionality. I'm going to fucking unplug my computer. I'm going to move it into my car. I'm going to take cords. I'm going to take keyboards. I'm going to pack my monitor. I'm going to move for one day. You think about how stupid that is. It's dumb. It's dumb. There's this thing called the internet. You can play with your friends on the internet. And unless y'all are like living on different continents, there's no lag. Y'all don't need to be on a local area network. It is objectively worse. And it's like, well, no, but at a land party, we're going to like get some pizza and watch some anime. It's like you can get anime and you can have a watch party. You can have pizza and watch anime with people over the internet. Why is it that a land party is fun? The intentionality. 
This is the crazy thing. The intentionality is what brings the joy. It is setting your mind in a direction and going in that direction. It is not being reflexive. See, this is the difference between being fired and quitting. One of them carries intention and one of them doesn't. One of them feels liberating, one of them feels terrible. Intentionality. And if we look at our lives today, how are we living them? We are not living intentionally. We're doing the exact opposite. We are living reflexively. What are the reflexes? Our reflexes are responding to what? They're being, responding to the stimuli of people outside of us. They're responding to the stimuli of advertisers. They're responding to the stimuli of microtransactions. They're responding to the stimuli of propaganda. They're responding to the stimuli of clickbait. So everyone is like, I really like watching YouTube, but I should really stop. Or I need to cut back on social media, but I have trouble. Why? What's the problem? Do you enjoy it? Well, yeah, kind of. So it's dopaminergic, but there's no intentionality. Right? So I've, I've never met a single person who has like been like, yeah, I want to wake up one day and just spend the whole fucking day browsing stupid shit on the internet. Maybe that person exists. Who knows? Like, I'm sure they exist somewhere. And if, even if you do it that way, I think that's going to be great. It's intentionality. This is what separates happiness from unhappiness. The second thing relates to something that we've already talked about is hard work. You see, we try to retreat from hard work. We think that, okay, the, uh, an absence of work is going to be the source of my happiness. And we go back to some of these things like, you know, pick a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But then the opposite is also true where people will say, take what you love and work. And then you'll destroy something that you love by turning it into your job. This assumes that your job is a fixed quantity that determines your happiness. And to have the right job, which is scientifically true, right? So there's fluctuations in the quality of work that you can do. So there are certain external things that are absolutely somewhat fixed. But the crazy thing is that according to this yogic path and stuff like that, they believe that you control a fair amount of it. They believe that you control even up to 100% of it. Let's say you control 50. Let's be fair. So we know from science on cognitively reframing and things like that, that there's some amount of control that you have. Scientifically, I don't think we can claim 100%. Buddha claims 100%, but who knows? So the other crazy thing is that if you think about planning your day off, so I know people who plan their days off. Sometimes I will plan my day off. And a lot of people will think, but that defeats the purpose of a day off. Because the whole purpose of a day off is that you're not supposed to work. And planning is working. And I'm trying to run away from working. And what you will find is that when you plan your day off, you will enjoy it so much more. And something cool will happen. When you plan your day off and you make your day off work... You will blend work and fun. And this is a good thing. Because right now, work is over here and fun is over here. And as long as these two things are separate, your happiness will be determined by your circumstances. If you have a day off, you will be happy. And if you don't have a day off, you will be sad. And I see this all the time on the internet. It's a very understandable sentiment. People are like, is this what life is? I slave away at work to go home, do laundry, cook, do this. I have one hour of recreation a day for two days on the weekend, one day of which is like getting caught up on stuff and like getting my car serviced and seeing the doctor or whatever and like doing my meal prep for the rest of the week so that I can eat healthy. Is this what life is? It's just tiny, tiny fractions of pleasure amongst a slog of effort. And we wonder why Gen Z and millennials are checking out. And that's where it's like, I'm not disputing that jobs can be bad and that I'm not saying you should be a slave or anything like that. But there is a component 
of this that you can control. There's a component of this that even if you have to work five days a week, you can do your best to make it enjoyable. You can shift your attitude a little bit towards it. You can change you can change the the space between work and pleasure. And one simple way to do that is to plan your days off. And you're going to say it feels like work. Yes, and you will enjoy it. It's adding that intentionality. And as you plan your days off, the rest of your days will become more tolerable. So, we, see, we try to bring pleasure into work. Why? So that we can bridge the gap between the two. That's a common sense, right? Common sense. Make your work more fun and you will have more fun. Duh. What are we doing? We're bridging the gap. But one thing that we never try to do is the opposite. Make your fun more like work. That's crazy, Dr. K. Same principle, bridge the gap. And now we understand why it's so hard for people. Because they're only doing it half, 50% of the time. We're only opening doors, we're never closing them. So bring work into your fun. And this is something that a lot of people have discovered. Every religious tradition on the planet, I don't know about every, most of the major ones, say that service is the source of happiness, which is fucking weird. Because I don't like doing someone else's dishes. I like it when someone does my dishes. Like, what craziness is this? And yet, just about every major religion on the planet will emphasize service towards other human beings. What are they on? Like, what are they smoking? But that's really how it is. When you do service for another human being, when you do your work with intentionality, with the intent to help others, it takes the pain of the work and it makes it go away. Right? So rarely nowadays, but I do some volunteer work. And that may sound weird because I work a lot. Like I work six days a week. Even on that seventh day, sometimes I work a couple days. I mean, honestly, some many weeks I work seven days a week. And then I'm, I'm planning on volunteering at something in, in the summer. Right? And why? It's crazy. But once you stop retreating from work, and once you start embracing it, and service is a really good way to do that, you will find that work is not as scary. And once work is not as scary, then you will have power over it. And it will no longer have power over you. I'm not saying that you should propagate some kind of unhealthy work environment, but I'm saying that you should not be controlled instinctively or reactively to the circumstances. Then by all means, craft a work environment that is ideal for you. But don't run away from work. Everyone wants to win the lottery and retire. Everyone wants to be left to their own devices. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. So I want you all to really think about this for a second. If you had complete financial freedom, who would be in control? You may say, I would be in control. But what is that I? When I talk to people who are financially free, truly free, I mean, we're talking like net worth of nine figures or higher. And I've worked with some of these people. What I oftentimes find is that they chase the idea of freedom. But the freedom that they're really chasing is an external freedom, an internal bondage. Then I can do whatever I want to. I can live according to my whims. Then I can be in full control of my desires. I've worked with trust fund babies who have bad addiction problems. Why? Because they're free. They don't have to work. A, they never had to work a day in their life. And their life is not full of joy. It's the opposite. Because the internal impulse says this, I'm going to do it. Internal impulse says this, I'm going to do it. I want to travel here, I go there. I do this, I do this. I have sex with this person. I get high over here. Internal bondage. External freedom and internal bondage. And I met some of the happiest people on the planet who have nothing. Crazy. Because we have all this research that tells us that 
you know, happiness correlates with money up to $100,000 or maybe a little bit more. And there's good reasons for that, right? So money provides security for sure, can take away some amounts of stress and like being able to pay rent. So it's not that money's bad. But the problem is that when we turn to things like external sources of happiness, we're not fundamentally in control of our lives. So if you look at like research on happiness, they'll say you should be happily married, have lots of friends and have lots of money and exercise and meditate. And for some of us, that's not an option. We struggle to create those things in our lives. So what about us? Does that mean we're not happy? This is the problem with the research on happiness is it gives you correlations. It tells you external things. It's not, it doesn't tell you actions. It tells you outcomes. It doesn't tell you what you can do. It tells you what you have to accomplish. And then there's an assumption that that accomplishment gives that happiness, which it doesn't, because this is correlative data. So on average, people who make that amount are more happier than people who make less than. And there's truth to that. I'm not saying that that's untrue. But we don't know the source of happiness. And source of happiness is really living with intentionality is a huge part of it. Not being reflexive is a huge part of it. And not shying away from difficulty is a huge part of it. It's not making your life easy. It's being okay with a hard life. That is the secret to happiness. I want you all to just think about that. And the whole problem is the easier we make our lives, the worse we get at being okay with difficulty. And so we make our lives easier and easier and easier. And the whole society is becoming harder and harder and harder. I don't have to walk. I can use a mechanized wheelchair. I don't have to leave the house. I can have food brought to me. I don't even have to do my job. I can use ChatGPT to write my emails and do my work for me. I don't need to do anything. You know, I read this story about someone who's like, I've got four jobs and I basically have ChatGPT do all the work. <laughs> Great. What do we see? We see a mental health crisis. Is there an economic component? Absolutely. But these th two things are not mutually exclusive. And so we find ourselves running in the wrong direction, and then we wonder why we ended up in the wrong place. We are deconditioning our minds, deconditioning our bodies. We're taking the elevator everywhere instead of the stairs, and we wonder why we're huffing and puffing, even walking down the street without any elevation. The anticipation of a day off brings so much joy because it's an, it's an excuse from our hard lives. We want to get rid of our hard lives. We want to avoid difficulty. And we sign ourselves up for deconditioning. And that's the real tragedy. The more deconditioned you, come, you become, the harder easy things get. And if you look at our community, you look at the fucking internet, what is the hallmark of the internet today? Easy things are hard. I don't know what to do. Making friends is hard. Finding love is hard. Finding a job is hard. Waking up in the morning is hard. Going to sleep is hard. Everything is hard, hard, hard. These are supposed to be the easy things in life. No one's like, oh shit, Winning a Nobel Prize is difficult. That's not what people complain about. Curing cancer is difficult. That's not what people complain about. The easy stuff has become hard. Society is to blame for this 100%, but so are we. People are making it harder for us by making it easier for us. And the more that we let them make it easier for us, the worse we do. See, we are to blame. We are following society. So we talk about this kind of stuff on the membership side sometimes. So who's to blame? 
So this is where we look at karma. Karma. So we'll give you all one last bit before we wrap up for the day. See, let's talk about blame and responsibility. So I think it's very fair to blame society. So I think society is at fault. The question is, what are you going to do about it? So this is, a, this is such a hard tightrope to walk in clinical practice. When I'm working with someone who, who's had a history of trauma, it's very difficult to say, it's not your fault that this happened to you, but, or and, you have control over whether it happens again. So when someone's in an abusive relationship, I don't think it's their fault that they were abused. But what their life looks like a year from now is in their hands. See, in life, we don't get to determine what, which cards are dealt. We only get to determine how we play the hand. We don't get to choose our circumstances in life. We get to choose how we play it, play the game of life. And so this is the tricky thing is we can blame society, and I think it's fair to blame society because I think society has made some mistakes, right? There are forces, organizations out there that are actively trying to make your life difficult. And then a lot of times people will ask me, so like I, I wrote this book about how to raise a healthy gamer. And parents will ask me all the time, why doesn't someone do something about all these addictive games? We should ban them. I'm like, sure, right? Like the world should be a different place. I agree with you. People should not make addictive shit and profit from it. I'm with you. What are you going to do about it? I was like, I should. The world should be a different place. Like, I agree. Like, I'm with you. People out there suck, bruh. I'm one of them. I used to be a shitty. Arguably still am. What are we going to do about it? So what I learned in my life is I can't wait for the world to fix itself in order for my life to be good. I literally can't wait. I'm not going to wait for what should happen to happen. And I remember I used to maul a lot when I was applying to medical school and failing to get in because I looked at the statistics and I saw that because I'm Indian, I have to basically have a standardized test score that is in the top 10%. Whereas if I was an underrepresented minority, like a Native American, different kind of Indian, then I could have a score in the bottom 40% and I could still get in. And I looked at this and I raged. I thought, oh my God, this is discrimination and racism. And everything should be racially blinded. Why? Because in this particular case, my race was screwing me. And you can make those arguments if you want to, but frankly, I think it's like from a me living my life perspective. What, am I going to sit around and wait for racism to be fixed? Is that my strategy for life? Doesn't sound like a good one. Racism is a fact of life. Should we strive to change it? 100%. Interestingly enough, I don't think that those admissions criteria are even bad nowadays. There's advantages and disadvantages. That's what we need to understand. Are you going to wait for the world to fix itself before you start being happy? Or are you going to take responsibility? This is what it means to take responsibility. Right? Life is shit. I'll agree with you. The Buddha will agree with you. And if we wait on other people to fix our lives, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I think it can happen. I've seen it happen before. I certainly had people go out of their way to help me fix mine, without which I couldn't be here. So that's pretty cool. And you have to take some responsibility. What can you do? And so we're here to help you do what you can do. And this is where we talk about things like karma. Right? It's your karma to be born in this place with your circumstances. But karma isn't about destiny. 
It's about the hand that you were dealt, but then you also have karma in terms of the way that you play the hand. If you play in this way, you have a chance of winning, and if you play in a different way, you have a greater chance of winning. So we look at our circumstances and we get really, really upset. And in doing so, we actually surrender the little or large power that we have. And this is the tightrope that's so difficult to walk with people who have a history of abuse, is it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And you control your future. Someone else doesn't. And this is literally what people who are abusive will try to convince people. They will try to convince their victims that they were powerless because that's when the abuser truly wins. When they convince you that you can do nothing. When the world convinces you that you're powerless. When the world convinces you that your vote doesn't matter. Right? This is what happens. They convince you to throw in the towel and that's when you really lose the game. It's nice to stream again. This is an absolute blessing to be with here with y'all today. So someone is asking, so my dad hitting me is my responsibility? Sorry. No, that's what I'm saying. It's a very tr tricky tightrope to walk. So let me try to explain. See, when someone is abused, there's a really tricky tightrope. Because on the one hand, it's not your fault, right? Clearly, like no one deserves to be the victim of abuse. I don't buy that. And at the same time, there's a really tricky balance between that and agency. So do you have power in the relationship or not? So the moment that you give up power, and there may be a power dynamic, absolutely. But the moment that you give up all of your power, then you're in big trouble. So literally what happens if you look at the psychology of abusers, what they will try to do is cut away people's independence and their sense of power. They will try to trick people into thinking that they are powerless. And the best way to trick someone is to add kernels of truth. Right? So if you look at something like a magic trick, like... 90% of what a magician shows you in a magic trick is exactly what you see. It's the 10% that's left that is completely false. And that's where all the money is. And that's how it is in an abusive relationship too. So I had a, I was working with someone who was in an abusive relationship and they were part of like a pretty sp specific religious organization. Incredible power dynamics between men and women. And there was a religious component. There was a societal component. There's a gendered component. This person genuinely had very little power. No access to bank accounts. No access to personal documents. No access to all kinds of stuff. Even when they would come to see me. They would pretend to be coming to the hospital. This is why they came to Massachusetts General Hospital. Because it's a general hospital. No one thinks of it as psychiatric treatment. Because they have cancer centers and this and that. And so she would come because she had women's issues, which her abusive partner didn't give two shits about. And so she genuinely has very little power, objectively. And yet she has a lot for her to realize that there is a step forward to gain more territory. That's what's so tricky about it, because it's not her fault. But unless she starts to change the way that she acts, this will be her destiny. So if that's the case, then who has the power? We like to think about these things in black and white, but it's so tricky. And that's what's so hard is you have to convince, I don't know, explain, explore, learn. Where does the power in your life lie? How much of it do you have in your two hands? And if you accept surrender, how much do you have left? It's like the hardest thing to do clinically is to find this weird, and I don't like know what the right answer is, but generally speaking, when I work with people who are in abusive relationships, claiming what little power they have and claiming more power over time is consistently the path to freedom. And this is what's really hard, especially when you have a minor, right? Because then there's such a powerful power dynamic. 
And it's like the minor can't choose to like leave the house at 16. They no, have no way to support themselves. So they have very little power in the relationship. And at the same time, the moment they acknowledge that this power dynamic is temporary, that I can still take steps to start to regain control of my life. It's beautiful. That's how they break free. I've seen this with people who are homosexual also growing up in very religious households. You know, get sent to things like conversion therapy and all kinds of just really nasty stuff. And they're able to grow out of it. It's amazing. So it's like working with those people that's made me realize that like we have a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. And the real tragedy is that we're unable to see it. And that doesn't make us dumb. It's logical, right? Because your whole life you haven't had power. Like someone else has been exerting it over you. So the concept that you're powerful is foreign. <clears throat> but it's through the, working with these people that I really realized like how much power we have in our two hands. It's amazing what those people have been capable of. And I believe that y'all are capable of it too, even if you're in a bad situation. I could be wrong. Maybe you're not. Maybe it's impossible. But generally speaking, my clinical experience has been the more I work with people, the more hope I have. The more I've come to respect victims of abuse and how much power they're able to gain over time. So it gives me hope. Even though despair is very logical. <laughs> yeah, so someone's saying learned helplessness. Well said, right? We even have a term for it. Yeah, so uh, someone's saying, I grew out of my abusive home only to be crushed in an abusive relationship. That's super sad, too, because that's so common. It's incredibly common. Someone's saying the concept that you have all the power can be very overwhelming. It's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> so what's, you don't have all the power. But see if you have maybe a little bit more than you originally thought. And then see if you can creep forward a little bit with more agency, more agency, more agency. Just see. Explore. Yeah, I see there are some Indian people in chat. Horror stories there, too. Just arranged marriages and all kinds of stuff. Like, even family members of mine have been through that. It's just so hard, dude. It's so hard. I mean, there, there are so many. And that, that's what's crazy is, like, I, I've seen so many cases where people have objectively very little power. And yet, they're able to take control of their lives. Like, it's nuts. And so then if that's true, and it happens consistently, then where does the power lie? It's something that I think about a lot. Like, I don't know. It's weird. <clears throat> Someone's saying uh, Indians are much more progressive now. In some parts of India, right? In some, some Indians. And it's crazy. It, it, sometimes I get shocked because that's what I thought too. And I think that's true, objectively. As a whole, the Indian race has become more progressive. And that they're, I'm sometimes shocked to discover what I see and hear and stuff like that. So anyway. Um, all right. Thank you all very much. It's been a blast. I think we've got uh, our trauma guide is now available for pre-order. So a lot of what I'm talking about, about power dynamics, trauma, abuse, if you all want to understand some of these things, like there's a lot of good info in there, including stuff on relationships. So we have a section specifically about the intersection of trauma and relationships, which I think is really, really important. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, let me see what else. Um, and schedule-wise, I hope you all enjoyed uh, the viewer interviews we had recently. It was super fun to do them for me personally. Like, I really enjoyed it. It's nice to be able to talk to people again. Um, I really enjoyed vibing with y'all today, chat. And last thing is we've got um, members detachment stream part two on Wednesday and members Q&A on Friday. So definitely check those out. We'll continue to have regular uh, video uploads as well throughout the week. So it's just more stuff if y'all want it. Um, take care, y'all. Thank y'all very much.